feels a little awkward, doesn't it? See, have you ever met people like that? You ever met somebody like that who, man, they love to talk about what they do for the Lord. Often I feel like people brag about what they do for the Lord, but really it's what they do for themselves. You ever met somebody like that? They try to hide behind their service in order to promote themselves, in order to make much of themselves. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a text that has somewhat inspired our 2020 vision, which is to turn ourselves and Emmanuel inside out in order to bring the outside into a deeper walk and relationship with Jesus. See, there was a song we sang that I absolutely love, and it was the last song, and they have this great lyric here, holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder the goodness and the holiness of God. And then once we have our eyes opened up, it says, show me who you are. Fill me with your heart. Once we've received the Lord, lead me in your love to those around me in church. That is a huge thing. I think there's so much doctrine and theology in some of the songs that we sing. We're so blessed to have a worship pastor that cares about the words we sing every week. We don't get wrapped up in a tune. We don't get wrapped up in a melody. We get wrapped in the theology and the goodness of God. And we're so grateful that Ricky Hall cares about that. There's truth in the statements that we sang today. There is no one like him. And when we are exposed to God, when we come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, We should respond in what? In gratitude as we make much of Jesus into the hearts and the lives of others. See, there was an old song that I learned a few years ago, but is much older than me. And that song, y'all, it, it, some of you might love this song. I'm sorry. I'm going to make fun of it just a little bit. Do you mind? Okay. We just have to have a good sense of humor with me. They will know we are Christians by our love by our love, and they'll know we are Christians by our love. (laughs) Like, I just see hippies sitting around a campfire when y'all are singing that song. Like, I feel like there's Christians and there might also be a peace pipe. Like, I'm not quite sure what's going on here. Anybody ever heard that song before? Did anybody ever sing that song like at a youth camp or in a worship service? Ricky Hall, be honest with me. I knew you did. I knew it. Ricky had a mullet and he was into it. I know it. Can't you just see that beautiful redheaded mullet just shaking in the background? I can picture it, man. Ricky, you are so pretty, buddy. I love that guy. Church, what I want for us to recognize is there's truth behind that awkward melody of a song, but truthful words. People will know that we are Christians by our fruit. We are known by our Love. See, there's a few words I wanted to break down this morning before we get into the text. One of them is sympathy. Sympathy is the word that means feelings of pity and sorrow for someone else's misfortune. So feeling bad when somebody else is having a hard time. Then the other word is empathy. The ability to understand and share the feelings of one another. I feel like that's a bigger bigger emotion than sympathy. Sympathy is just to feel bad when somebody else is having a difficult time, like most of you felt for me during the meeting today. Y'all, I cannot remember one of my deacon's names. I stared at him for 30 seconds and had no idea what his name was. It was a hard time for me this morning, but I don't think anybody empathized, okay? I don't think anybody really felt my pain there. Y'all made fun of me. I'm just saying. The ability to understand and share the feelings of one another. But then the other word is compassion. Sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings and the misfortunes of others. And we're going to be looking at those three words today, specifically empathy and compassion. See, what we're going to look at is Luke 10, verses 25 through 37. And in verse 25 through 37, what we're going to see is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, we know the story. You can recall it, I'm sure. But do you remember why it was set up in the first place? See, the setup is huge. Often when we're looking at scripture, I think we make less of the context than we should. When you are looking over scripture, when you are studying scripture this year, we want to understand who is writing, what they're saying, who they're talking to. And it's important to recognize who Jesus is talking to. So he explains it in verse 25. There was an expert in the law who stood up to test him. This is a lawyer. And this lawyer didn't work for criminal cases, but rather he worked for the temple is what we would guess. And he says, teacher, what must I I do to inherit eternal life? 
What is written in the law, Jesus asked him. How do you read it? So what does it say in the law? How do you interpret it? See, what this guy was asking him, what this lawyer was asking him was to test Jesus. He already had an answer. He already knew what he was planning to say. See, he just wanted to see if Jesus' answer was going to agree with his. And if Jesus were to say the truth very clearly, very plainly, if he were to say, reject all others, follow me with all your heart, soul, mind, commit your life to me, and then you'll be saved. Then he would have been convicted of heresy, blasphemy. There would have been a lot of issues. So what does Jesus say? Hey, you've read the law. What do you think it says? And so instead of quoting all 600 rules within the law, he quotes the main ones. He summarizes in verse 27. He answers, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. That's one text. And then he combined it with another text in the Old Testament. And love your neighbor as yourself. He does a good job. Jesus responds. You've answered correctly. He told him, do this and you will live. Now, this conversation could have stopped right there. Like, that's a great ending point. But then you have this awkward moment where this guy has to do something a little weird. And what he does, this lawyer, because lawyers just don't know when to quit. Amen? I'm just kidding. Don't say amen. Verse 29, wanting to justify himself. Uh Uh-oh. Wanting to justify himself. He does this. He asks Jesus, and who is my neighbor? See, he could have just walked away with that answer, but he wants to make the matter just a little bit easier for him to handle. If I have to love my neighbor as myself, okay, who's my neighbor? Let's get specific here because if I have to, have to love my neighbor, I want to know exactly who that is because if that's like my, like my real close family, my wife, my kids, I can work with that. But if that's broader, maybe like that other guy that lives down the street from me, like is it just my neighborhood, my cul-de-sac, what? And this is where we're getting at. Verse 30, Jesus took up the question and said, and that's the setup for this parable. Here we go. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. So there's three discoveries we're going to make in this parable. The first one being is that we're dealing with a hurting person. There are people hurting everywhere we look. We have to recognize that, church. Everywhere we look, there are people hurting. See, one of the things that we'll talk about today is there are three ways in which we can look at people. Three ways. We can look at people as scenery, meaning they're kind of in our peripheral. They're there, but they're not really there. We're not really concerned about them. We don't pay any attention to them. We have scenery people in our lives every day. They're the people you drive past, the people you walk past, the people that you look over and don't pay much attention to. And then you have people that are machinery. Now, the machinery people are the people that you have to work with in order to get through your life. They're the waiter at your uh, favorite restaurant. They're the coworker. They're your boss. They're the people that you are in a relationship with simply for a transaction. So you have scenery, you have machinery, and then you have ministry. And you have people in your life that you recognize you are called to minister to. Now let me tell you a secret. I don't believe that God puts anybody in our life to simply be scenery or machinery. I don't think God has placed anybody in your life so they'll simply be scenery and machinery. I think God has put everyone in your life so that you have the ability to do ministry in their hearts and in their lives. Wasn't there a famous U.S. president that said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country? Often what we can do is we can simply look at people as what they can do for us rather than what we can do for them. See, church, I feel like all too often we walk through our day-to-day lives for Getting that there is an eternity at stake. There is a real thing such as heaven and hell. And we need to be super aware of that because people are hurting and dying without Jesus every single day. And that should bother us. Just to give you a little bit of cultural context, this trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, he says he went down because literally it was a long way down. The uh, sea level was completely different. Jerusalem is 2,700 feet above sea level. Jericho is 800 feet 
below sea level. So there's basically mountainous terrain they're going through. It's a very winding road. It's 17 miles long. And hear me, as you descend the 3,500 feet on this road, it was known as the bloody way because there were so many people that would hide along this road in order to take advantage of travelers. At the time Jesus is telling the story, they knew that this road was very, very popular for people that were seeking to rob and steal from others because Herod had laid off over 65 thousand people from the, um, from the temple, which was their main source of income in Jerusalem. And because he had laid off so many thousands of people, they were desperate for finances. And often desperate people resort to desperate measures to provide for themselves and their family, don't they? See, I think we need to recognize this. The same people that beat up and hurt this man, this Jewish man, were hurt themselves. If you've ever been hurt before, I want to remind you of a phrase I use often. Hurt people hurt people. Do you hear that? Do you understand what that means? Hurt people like to hurt other people. See, there are people in my life that have hurt me just like you've had so many people hurt you. And for a long time, I would get very bitter and I would dwell on it. Y'all, I can be a bitter dweller kind of person. You know what I mean? Do we have any dwellers in here? You know, where you just, it's so hard to let things go and you replay things over and over in your mind. And I did that and I struggled with that for so many years. And finally, somebody told me this. They said, do you ever wonder why that person is so hurtful to others? Maybe we should sit them down one day and ask them, who hurt you? What happened in your life? Because there's a story there. There's a reason why you're acting out like this. There's a reason why you do that. There's a reason why you hurt others because at some point in your life, you've been hurt yourself. Hurt people, desperate people hurt others, church. I think one thing we need to remember is often the people that need our love and need our ministry, need us to minister to them are the very people that are hurting us and the people we care about. It's the very same people that don't agree with our political backgrounds, that don't agree with what we stand for, that do not agree with the church, and the same people that hurt the people that you love and even yourself desperately need you to love them, to pray for them, and to minister to them because hurt people hurt people. So when we look at this situation, this man has been beaten up beyond what's acceptable if there's ever such a thing. So what's happening is he's gotten beat up. He's heard the word, the verb for beating him up means continuously beat him up. This beating up process lasted a while, church. So this man is past the point of being able to walk home. He's probably unconscious. He's pretty close to death. As one theologian wrote one of the books I read today, he was circling the drain. You know what I mean? You ever heard that before? I had to look it up. Anyway, here's what's going on. This guy is in this bad way. He's in this bad situation and he's praying. We would imagine if you were him, you'd be praying for somebody to come by that would help you. A savior to save you. He is hurting. He is desperate. Church, I read this week and I'm just reminded. In every pew, there's a broken heart. Amen. In every pew, there's a broken heart. Church, what we have to realize is hurting people are all around us or even sitting next to you right now. That's discovery number one. Discovery number two, people long to see if Christians really care. People long to see if Christians really care. Have you ever been in a situation where you feel completely alone? Isn't that a scary feeling? Isn't that a terrifying feeling? Church, what I want for you to realize is this, is that we are called to love one another. We're called to love Christians and non-Christians alike, but the world is expecting Christians to act like Christians. See, a few years ago, I was sitting with a group of college students, and there were two adult women, probably in their 40s and 50s, and they started talking about how they grew up through elementary, middle school, and high school in a non-Christian home non-Christian parents, non-church going home. Both of them had never gone to church ever in their lives is what they told us. Until they got out of college and they married Christian men and then gave their lives to Christ and then started following after the Lord. 
But both of them admitted this. They said they had so many Christian friends. They had so many church-going friends. They had so many friends that they would hang out and spend the night at their house on Saturday night. But those girls would always leave the next morning and go to church, but they never got invited. Those two women always told me that they never got invited by their Christian friends, and it made them wonder why they were not worthy to come to church themselves because an invitation had never been given. And it absolutely blew my mind because here's what it revealed to me. People want to be loved. People want to be accepted more than we realize. And there's so many people that want an invitation to come and to participate in things that will bring them closer to Jesus. And all we have to do is ask. But often by us being afraid to ask or whatever excuse we want to give, it makes them feel left out. It makes them feel unworthy. It makes them feel not good enough, church. We need to be more open with our invitations because I think often we're afraid of offending them. I think they're offended when we don't, when we don't care about them enough to extend the invitation to them. People long to see if Christians really care. Verse 31, a priest happened to be going down that road when he saw him. At this point, you can only imagine that all the Jews that are listening to Jesus tell the story, their ears are perked up because a priest is going to do the right thing. See, a priest at the time was like the all-star of religious leaders. He was the one that got to go into the holy of holies. He was the only one that got to encounter the spirit of God. He was the only one that got the opportunity to do the sacrifices. He was the only one that got the opportunity to stand before the presence of God himself. It was a big deal to be a priest. And if anybody's going to do the right thing, it's going to be this guy. There's 1,200 priest in Jericho. They all knew a priest. They all knew that they had, they were very easily identified. They always walked around with this air about them that was very noble. And so they're thinking, all right, Jesus is about to give this guy, let him be the champion, the hero of the story. But what does he say? He passed on the other side. Uh Uh-oh. But then they have another chance of hope because in verse 32, it says in the same way, a Levite when he arrived at that place, saw him. So now they're thinking, okay, the priest didn't, but certainly the Levite would. The priest might be too busy to help him. He might have some things to do. Also, the priest wasn't really about touching dead bodies and stuff. That was unclean and Samaritan, or uh, the, they didn't want to get blood on their hands. And you know, it's probably just not a good look for him. Didn't want to get his robe dirty. But a Levite also was a pretty respected person because a Levite was of the same tribe that all the priests came from. So if you weren't a priest, but a Levite, you were still seen as pretty holy. Pretty awesome, pretty good person. So thinking certainly the Levi's going to help. But what happens? He goes to the other side. What do you think are reasons why we don't help people? Here's a couple of reasons I came up with this week I started to think about. I think sometimes Christians are afraid to help people because we're afraid of the judgment we'll get from other Christians. I think sometimes we're afraid that people are trying to think we're showing off or maybe we're a hypocrite. I think we're sometimes afraid of some of the backlash we might hear from others who do not approve of how we're serving. See, I also think that sometimes we don't feel qualified. I think that's one of the biggest ones. I think often when we get to a point where we need to serve others, maybe we're at the point where we don't feel qualified and we start to make up all of these excuses. Hey God, I don't really feel equipped for that. God, I don't really feel trained for that. God, I don't really feel worthy to do that. And those are all feelings that I feel like are very natural. But God never gave you those feelings. Those are a gift from the enemy, not from the Lord. And God is never going to call you to something that he won't equip you to accomplish for his honor and for his glory. One of my favorite phrases is is that if God has called you to it, he will see you through it. God does not call the equipped. He always equips the called church. And what we need to recognize is that when we make less of ourselves as Christians, what we're really doing when we're saying that we are not good enough or qualified enough to do what God has called us to do, we're making less of the Holy Spirit within us that says that we have the ability to 
to do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Church, we need to remember that the Holy Spirit of God lives within us if we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord. And when we start to say that we are not equipped to do what clearly God is calling us to do, you are making less of the Jesus that lives inside of you. We need to get more into the fact that Jesus Christ himself has given us the ability to do things that we don't think we can do. Here's where I'm coming from, church. We love to make excuses. We love it, love it, love it because it gets us out of it. But here's the truth. I'm so tired of Christians saying that they just don't think that they can. Church, my word of God says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We teach our children that verse all the time. We give them cute little Bible verses. We get them to memorize it. We get them to learn it in a song. We get them to learn cute little hand motions. But here's the problem. We as adults don't live it out. We have to start living out the truth that if Jesus is in it and he's calling us to it, he's going to call us through it. He's going to get us through it, church. So let's start being more confident in the fact that the Holy Spirit lives in us. There was something going around on social media the past couple of weeks I really appreciated. It said, when we get to heaven, we're going to have a great time sitting in front of guys like Moses and David and talking about all these miraculous things that they were able to see, all those amazing experiences that they've had. We're going to be able to talk about, man, it was so awesome. I can only imagine how neat it was, David, for you to throw that stone and see that giant fall. And Moses, it was probably so awesome to watch that sea part and know how crazy was it when you were on that boat. We're going to tell them all, ask them all these questions about their experiences. And those Old Testament guys are going to look at us and they're going to go, what was it like? to have the Holy Spirit of the living God living inside of you. What was that like? Because they never got to experience that. So you remember Moses had to hide in the cleft of a rock when the Holy Spirit of God went by. See, we have Jesus Christ within us. We can look at God face to face, not because we're righteous, but because the righteousness of God has forgiven us of our sins. We are covered in the blood of Jesus' church. The Holy Spirit reigns in us, so we do not have any more excuses. Church, it's time that we start doing more than what we think we're capable of we love to say other things like it's just too much work. We love to say things like I just don't have the time. Can I just go ahead and tell you? Life living for yourself ain't worth living. And when God's called you to do something, he's called you to make the time to make it happen. And I think another thing is we don't realize the eternal impact that you can have through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. James 2 says that if we can see the suffering of others and not be moved to pour ourselves out for them, then our faith is dead. We can talk about Jesus all day long, but if we don't have compassion and empathy for others, our faith is dead. Verse 33, but a Samaritan on his journey came up to him. So at this moment, the Jews that are listening to Jesus tell this parable are getting pumped because he just kind of insulted them a little bit. You know, he insulted the priests, insults the Levites, so they're thinking, oh, great. Well, the real villain of the story is going to be the Samaritan because it was no secret that they hated Samaritans. They would avoid Samaritan villages at all costs. They would avoid Samaritans at all costs. There was even this moment that you can see in the New Testament where Jesus and his disciples are walking by a village of Samaritans, and they asked Jesus if he would call down fire and blow the village up. They couldn't stand them. And he brings them up. And all of a sudden they're going to get excited because guess what? He's about to say some mean things about Samaritans. But what does he say? The Samaritan saw the man and had compassion. At this moment, that lawyer is flipping out. He's absolutely losing his mind because Jesus has insulted the priest. He's insulted the Levite, but he's praising the Samaritan. Here's what was up with Samaritans. They didn't even believe that Samaritans followed after the Lord. And in today's modern term, they wouldn't call the Samaritans Christians. Hey, they're not Christians. They don't follow after you. They don't love the Lord. They don't follow after God. They don't believe in the things that we believe. And you're going to make him the hero of the story? What is going on? See, often I think we as Christians look horrible because we get so caught up in tradition and rules per se, rather than loving others the way that Jesus loved them. See, 
when he uses this word compassion, that word is actually the word splagma, which we translate as compassion very clearly. But what they would use, the definition of this, according to their language, would be pity from your deepest soul. Pity from your deepest soul to be wrecked, to have an uncontrollable emotion. Church, I don't know when was the last time that you had an uncontrollable emotion that there were people that were lost and desperately needed the Lord. I don't know when was the last time that you had an uncontrollable emotion that people desperately needed your help and you had the ability to help them. Church, one of my favorite books right now is a book written by David Platt. And he wrote this book about how he was going through the mountains of some villages in the other part of the world, the Himalayas, I believe. And there was this moment where he was told, hey, we've got the ability to help these villages, but we can't help them today. They desperately need food, but we can't give them any today because it's not the time. So if you'll just wait to give them anything, I promise we're going to have food for them in a few days. Well, here's the scary thing. As he was hiking through, he had all of the food he needed to get through his hike, just enough. And a young girl came to him begging for food. And if you've ever been in another country and watched somebody beg for food, it will absolutely break your heart, won't it? If you ever watched somebody hungry and they simply did not have anything to eat, isn't it humbling? Doesn't absolutely make your soul turn. And David Platt said that he was trying to be respectful of his host and he couldn't speak their language and let her know that food was coming. But she got so angry and so hurt because she so desperately needed his help and he had the ability to help her and he struggled. Here's my thing, church. We have the ability to help so many people that we come in contact with every single day and they need Jesus a whole lot more than that little girl needed food. Can I tell you that? We need to recognize that. There are people that are so hungry and starving for truth. So hungry and starving to be loved like Jesus has loved you. And you have the ability to love others. We do not have an excuse. See, the religious leaders, they got caught up in their duties and they missed that their duty was to love people. Once again, we have machinery and we have scenery and often the machinery and the scenery cover up the fact that we are called to do ministry. We are called to do ministry. See, we have the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Jesus taught that, but I believe that in Ephesians 4.32, Paul upgraded that rule just a little bit when he said, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgive one another, as Christ forgives you. One of my favorite preachers, J.D. Greer, he wrote this on Twitter this week. He said, uh, you might have the golden rule from Jesus, but Paul wrote a platinum rule. Instead of saying, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, Paul wrote, do unto others as Jesus has done for you. Goodness. I think it's going to be such a challenge to live by the platinum rule. But I think that's what we've been called to do. We have been called to make much of Jesus and to love others like he has loved us. So what did this man do? What did the Samaritan do? Verse 34, he went over to him, bandaged his wound, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he put on his, him, on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave him to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. See, the religious men, the Jews should have stopped and helped the Jews, but they didn't. The Samaritan should have passed by, but he didn't. See, the Samaritan became the hero. Why? Because he understood compassion. He had that word splagma for him. He had this deep, overwhelming sense of empathy for him. He felt this man's pain and unknowing to him, he treated this man like Jesus treats us. See, in Paul, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 
If I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noising gong. I am a clanging cymbal. He said, if I have the gift of prophecy, if I know all the mysteries and all the knowledge, if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but I don't have love, it's nothing. I am nothing. He says, if I give all my possessions to feed the poor and deliver my body to be burned, but do not love, it profits nothing. The Levites and the priests with all of their good works were profiting nothing. If you call yourself a Christian but do not love lavishly, it profits the kingdom nothing. Church, I think that that needs to change the motive of what we do. I think often Christians are doing the right things in some instances, but our motive is wrong. I think often we give financially out of obligation because we know we're commanded to do it. But I really think our motive should be out of love for the Lord. I think often we serve because we enjoy hanging out with our friends and we enjoy hanging out with the pastors on staff that asked us to. And we just enjoy that gifting that God's given us. But I don't think we realize that we are called to serve out of love for the Father and love for others. Love is the motivator. Then we see discovery number three. People need to see and experience Love in action. The Levite had no compassion. (laughs) The priest, no compassion. The Samaritan, who wouldn't even be viewed as a believer, had all of the compassion. You know what's scary? People are leaving the church on a daily basis because they feel like they are not loved. Can I tell you that breaks my heart. Studies show that most millennials and Generation X young people are leaving the church in droves because they don't feel loved in the church. I find that to be a problem. Church, we are called to love people verbatim. Now, here's what I want for us to understand. We will always be a place that stands against sin. We will call sin sin every single time we see it, but we will do that in love. We don't do that so that we condemn a person. We do that so we can be a part of their salvation and their discipleship process, helping them work through some hard things going on in their life in a loving way. Church, Christ died for our sins, loved us enough as who we are, but loves us too much to allow us to remain the same. He has called us to continuously look more like him, and we need to love others through that process as well. I'm reminded about what Jesus did when he had a woman brought to him who had committed the act of adultery. You guys remember this story? Jesus has this woman brought to him. And once again, the religious people are trying to catch Jesus doing something wrong because the Mosaic law said that this woman who was caught in the act would have to be stoned right then and there. And what did Jesus do? Jesus protected her. This woman was shamed. This woman was humiliated. This woman was being mocked and made fun of. She was absolutely having the worst day of her life, completely embarrassed about how all of these religious people were treating her. And what did Jesus do? He never called her sin okay. He told her to sin no more, but he stood in the gap between the religious hateful people and the woman protecting her and showing her what love looks like. That's a picture of the gospel. Church, we have to love in the way that Christ loved others. We stand against sin, but we stand up for people. We stand up for people as a church. But here's what we need to understand. Love is messy. Love is going to be messy. When we love people well, it's going to be a messy situation. Church, I know too many churches all over the country that look like cemeteries. You ever been in those? They just look dead. But you know what a healthy church looks like? A healthy church looks like a hospital. Healthy church looks like a hospital. It's not where everybody's perfect. It's where everybody's there loving and working on each other through the glory of Christ together. It's where everybody is in it together. But hospitals, they have some issues, don't they? See, hospitals are kind of weird because they have weird smells. They have issues. People are running in with emergencies. It is an awkward place to be at times. But life is saved and life is had in a hospital. And I want to be willing to be a part of something like that. But real love is messy. Secondly, what we're going to learn is real love is sacrificial. 
Real love is sacrificial. What did this guy do, this Samaritan, who shouldn't care about this Jew whatsoever? He sacrifices his own finances in a big way to take care of this man. Undoubtedly, as he moved this man over to his animal and carried him and brought him to the inn, he undoubtedly got this man's blood and dirt and grime and sweat all over him. But I don't see this guy complaining. I don't see him making excuses. I see him choosing to love. Here's my scary thing. People are looking for love and if they can't find it in the church, they're gonna go somewhere else. They're gonna go to a place that will love them. And guess what? The world has disguised themselves as a loving and accepting place. And they are having so many people join their congregation every single day. And it's scary and it's heartbreaking. And Jesus is looking at his bride going to love the people that I died to save. Love them, serve them, protect them, care about them. Don't look at them as machinery. Don't look at them as scenery, but look at them as ministry. Church, I love you guys. And I think we're doing a great job in so many capacities, but can I ask us, can we take this year and turn the dial up a notch? Can, can we crank up the volume on our love for our community and the world? And can we do anything and everything to try to make much of Jesus in a bigger way than we ever had for 2020? I believe in setting goals. And our goal this year is to be bigger servants in our community than we ever have been. And we don't do that simply from me preaching it on the pulpit. We do that from when you leave this room, you deciding to make much of Jesus and the people that are around you. Loving the people around you, not treating them as scenery or machinery, but ministry. Church, in a moment, I'm gonna pray. And we're gonna open up this altar. We're gonna ask you guys, if you wanna come down and pray, go ahead. If you need to talk to myself or brother Jeremy about joining, about salvation, whatever you need. Have the boldness to be bold for the Jesus that was bold enough to die for you. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to make much of you today. God, we have seen you do some incredible things through our services over the past few months. And we're grateful. God, we're humbled that for some reason you look down on us and call us a useful vessel that you're willing to use. We're so unworthy, but you, hmm, you make a message out of our mess and we're grateful. God, I pray that you will continue to keep the doors open of this church so that we can continue to love the people around us to make much of you in our community and to see this community turn their hearts away from the world into you. God, I pray that we will not make excuses, but rather will pursue you in all things. Lord, we love in your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we sing?